Okay, we are live. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of uh, Preaching to the Choir Ministries. I'm here today with uh, an atheist that wanted to um, that wanted to uh, be part of this particular um, hangout. We might have more here later. I'll let him introduce himself to all of you out there. Take it away. Sure. My name's uh, John F. McDropout. Uh, I'm uh, sort of a new kind of outspoken atheist on the YouTube uh, area. I'm not really trying to be uh, convince anybody either way, but uh, I, I am kind of trying to get involved in the conversation, and I do find it extremely interesting. Um, I've been uh, doing this for probably about two months, uh, just kind of catching up on the podcast and uh, and talking to uh, atheists and theists, seeing where everybody's uh, standing on these issues. Uh, it's okay. always, always really interesting to talk to talk to people with different points of view. You you look familiar. Really? Oh, it's possible. Do you uh, have videos on YouTube? I uh, don't have any uh, in particular. Uh, nothing that I post anyway. Uh, have you been on other Google Hangouts? Or? I have been on a few Google Hangouts, uh, so it's, it's possible you've seen me in a few of those. Uh, maybe with the Bible thumping we not, or uh, I do talk to that uh, guy. He's never invited me on his uh, with any of his Hangouts. I have I have been involved in a few chats and uh, email exchanges with him, but nothing nothing into, uh, in particular. Oh, okay. Right. Uh, so yeah, definitely. I've kind of done a little bit on like fundamentally flawed, and maybe a little bit with the Magic Camera show uh, dropping in. Uh, there's there's a few different fundamentally flawed. There. That's where I saw you. Okay. Because I was invited to that program. I'm oh, supposed yeah. to be on there. I think uh, two weeks or something like that. Absolutely. Well, I, I think they're uh, they're they're a pretty great bunch of guys there, and uh, they do they do let you get at least your uh, your point across. If uh, if not, uh, I mean, they do. They, there are some guys on there who can be a little more cruel, uh, especially when they open up the chat. These these last couple ones have been uh, been pretty pretty insane. Mm, mm, mm. Okay, so let's do this. Um, I did a earlier. I did a live broadcast, um, trying to answer uh, some some questions for the atheist uh, community uh, because uh, lately I've been having problems with my with uploading videos because it's been taking so long. You know, to to upload a a ten minute video like YouTube is telling me it's taking like um like an hour and a half <laughs> to oh, upload yeah. a ten minute video. So because the camera I guess I'm using, I guess the file is so big, I suppose that it takes that long or whatever. I don't know. Oh, I but um, I figured doing these Google Hangouts, I can start answering people's questions that way instead of always having to upload a video about one yeah. particular person's uh, specific question. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So um, when I made that video earlier, um, I know I had a couple of viewers. I think you was you was one of them. Um, I attempted to answer some questions, but I was just babbling at that point, so I decided to delete that video. But um, now that I got you here, um, if there's something that you would like to ask me on behalf of the atheist community, um, sure. Sure. so that I can answer this, people think I'm ignoring them, and I'm not. <laughs> Sure. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, on the last Fundamentally Flawed, uh, Alex uh, Botton mentioned that you, you believe that the, uh, the answered prayer is uh, proof of God, God's existence. Uh, yes. And that seems, uh, it, just, it just seems a little, um, a little strange, uh, mostly because we're talking about, uh, I mean, we're talking about prayer, right? So it's already yes. kind of uh, a desire. Um, and uh, so, I mean, it's sort of subjective when we're asking it already. Uh, what we're asking for, right? Um, we're not usually asking for things that are physically impossible, or but uh, more more likely things that are highly unlikely is what we're usually right. uh, praying about, right? Right. So it, it seems it seems a little disingenuous to say that answer prayer would be the uh, the proof of God, um, only because uh, unanswered prayer would then be considered proof of God's non-existence. Do you see what I'm saying? Okay, just to in a, in an absolute, we are talking about the God of the Bible here, right? We're not talking about no other God here, right? Talking sure, about God of the Bible. sure. We can for for for, the, for this argument, we can talk about the God of the Bible. Okay. Now, that, I mean, that's my that's my that's my problem with the with the idea. I mean, how uh, is is unanswered prayer proof of God's non-existence? Would be my would my well. Question. The first thing that we had to take into consideration is uh, what we would consider an answered prayer. You know, um, like, for example, I'm having a conversation with you right now. Right. Um, I can ask you a direct question right now, or I can ask you to do something. And you can tell me one of three things. You could tell me yes, you could tell me no, or you can tell me um, not now, or you could be like, um, yeah, I can, you don't I can, need a it or non, something like a non that. You know what I mean? Like a truth indeterminant or something like that. Uh, 
and neither yeah, neither yeah, positive nor negative. Like right. Okay. Now here's the thing. Um, well, first, have you heard the argument of answer prayer? Um, okay, let's actually just run me? through it. No, let's let's run through it. I mean, because I'm sure there's a more structured form, and, I, and it would be a lot probably helpful for me to see it in a, in a syllogism. Is it a syllogism form, or you got kind of a more of a more of a weak I can give you, narrative form? I can give you the nutshell part of it sure. um, because it takes me about about six minutes to get into it. If you want to hear it, absolutely. Please let's let's, let's go ahead. It's your it's your show, so I, I, uh, I'll I'll defer to you as to as to the direction we take. But I'd I'd love to hear it if, if, if you'd like. Okay, it goes like this. So the, first and foremost, um, with my experience I have with the atheists, the first thing I would ask them is, is that, um, you know, because one of the common questions that we get out there on, on my side of the argument is, okay, what, I'm, I'm, from atheists coming to us is, well, what is God or who is God or, you know, can you describe him, can you define him, right? Yeah. So I'll ask the atheists, I'll ask them, I'll say, well, is God material or immaterial? Okay. They claim they have all these experiences, how Christians have been um, um, sharing their faith with them, you know, for all these years and whatnot. And they actually claim they actually believe that one time themselves. So I'm assuming they have some idea what what or who God is and whatnot. So I expect the atheist to say that God is immaterial and not material, because if he was material, then we would be able to physically see him with our eyes. You know what I mean? The Bible describes God as a spirit and those that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Okay, that's why I say that he's immaterial. Once we establish the fact that he's immaterial, okay, my next question for the atheist is this. How does God go about, um, how, how does this immaterial God go about communicating with the material world? Okay, and then I'll go into the gravity example about how we can test gravity by the laws that we have for gravity. What comes up must come down. Okay. Um, we don't know what gravity feels like. We, 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 we really can't tell you what it looks like. But we know it's there because of the laws of gravity. Again, you can pick something up and it'll fall down, right? So I'll say, in in the same ways, God can show Himself to be real to the material world by answering our prayers. And the argument goes like this: that you can get a prayer journal, okay? You can write down what you prayed for, okay? When you made the prayer, when the prayer was answered, and what the circumstances of those prayers and how they was answered and whatnot. And for a Christian like myself, that would be that would be personal proof that God exists. That he's that 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 I'm getting on my knees and I'm I'm not talking to myself. That someone out there that's greater than me is hearing my prayers and is able to answer my prayers. Okay. Um, likewise, same way I'm talking to you, I can ask you a direct question and you can give me a direct answer. You know what I mean? Uh, but this is proof for myself. But what about the person outside of myself? Well, I can do the same thing. I can get a prayer journal. I can write down um, what I'm praying for for you. We call this intercessory prayer. Okay. I can write down what I'm praying for for you, um, what I pray for concerning you, what the circumstances was for that prayer being answered. Okay. And then um, 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 I'll have my actual proof that, that God answered, answered my prayer concerning you. And I can come to you and show you, listen, you don't know this. I prayed for you, you know, and on, on this date. You know what I mean, and then and then um um, um this is what I prayed for, and in and, and in your situation, you know, you went to your friends, you went to your relatives, none of them could help you. You know what I mean? So um um I got on my knees, I prayed, and I asked God, look what God did for you. See um what I think a lot of atheists don't un don't understand about prayer is Christians typically won't go to God asking for things until we actually need it. Typically, you have some Christians that will ask God for stuff before we need them, but the majority of the time, we get on our knees and we ask God for things when we really, 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 really need it, or when he leads us to pray. So when I ask the atheists to try to disprove this argument, that answer prayer is proof that God exists, I get a couple of, I, I get these um, these uh, th these objections. The first objection usually um Usually is is that well, I, okay? The one I most recently got, or I'm getting from the atheist community, is, is um, it's this whole thing about coincidence. Okay, they can't go very deep on it. If I ask some questions about how is a coincidence, um, start getting specific with it, they can't really go very deep into it. Okay, um, but some of the uh, the answers that I get for um, people debunking answer prayer is is that um. 
you know, like you said yourself uh, a minute ago, well, not a minute ago, but five minutes ago when you said that unanswered prayer is proof of the non non-existence of God, and I would say no. No. And then and the, and the, and the reason why it isn't, because I can ask you a question, and you can choose not to answer it. Hmm. You understand what I'm saying? I can ask you right now, are you a wrestling fan? And then you'll... Yeah, you don't have to answer. You understand what I'm saying? So you can't say, yeah, you can't say that non-answered prayer is um is proof that um is proof that that um that that God does not exist for that reason. You would have to first um be able to go into the Bible and see what the Bible says about prayer, and then be able to refute it that way. If you're going to argue with a Christian about um answered prayer not being proof that God exists. And I find that a lot of atheists in the atheist community don't know this, and then two, they don't they, they don't even try. And then when they do try, they, they 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 go to the scripture in Matthew where Jesus is teaching his disciples how to pray, which is not a good example at all to try to do, to try to refute um answer prayer. Hmm. I know it's babbling there for a moment, but nah, no, no problem, no problem. All right. Well, I but I um I'm still I'm still a little um confused maybe about the analogy. Uh, because uh, because the question uh, "Am I a wrestling fan?" can be non-answered, right? Um, right. But but um, I don't think the analogy extends to all circumstances in prayer. Uh, just simply because I can imagine a situation where um, a non-answer is actually a negative response. Uh, do you see what I'm saying? Where the only we're not doing something or or choosing to uh, not act will, will be the, the negative response to that when you're asking for something to be stopped or for an action to be halted. I can see that would be, um, it would still be, a ne you see what I'm saying, where the, where the negative is implied in the, in the non-response. Um, right. So w w would you say in a situation like that we could, we could infer uh, that God was not active in that situation or are we, are we relying on the excuse that, uh, that it's not within God's will? Well, I think it's fair to, to question whether or not he exists if he's not answering your prayer. But then we would have to investigate on why he's not answering your prayer. We would have to see what you're praying for and whether or not what you're praying for is consistent with the scriptures. Um, and we would have to take a look at um, um, where you are in your life when you're praying. Like, for example, um, in the Gospel of John, I forget specifically where. I think it's in John, John chapter 14. I really should have this in front of me. Let me see if I can find it. Um, Jesus basically tells his disciples that if you abide in me and I in you, you can ask for whatever you want in my name and then I will do it. Okay? Right. And what that word abide means, it means to remain. It means to be, to, 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 to be connected with Jesus Christ. Okay? And if, and, and, and if we're connected to him, we will know what to pray. And then when we pray, God will certainly answer those prayers. Like, for example, you're not going to be a Christian and get on your knees and ask God to give you Fort Knox. You understand what I'm saying? Uh, uh, a could. Christian isn't going to ask God. Um, I, think that's, I, think that's the, I think that's maybe that's where my misunderstanding comes, is because uh, human beings can be mistaken about what they could ask the deity to do, um, whichever one that they're, that they're praying to. And I'm, I'm worried that that's, that's, the, that's the inherent weakness of your argument there, is that, is that we don't know if our asking is what uh, will be done and, and will, I mean, because God already knows the future, I guess there's that weird uh, thing, but let's, for, let's put that aside for a moment. Like, we don't know if we're asking the right, the, the right question or the right request. Do you see what I'm saying? Oh, yeah, I totally see that. But that's why we have this, because this teaches us what to pray for. Mm. It, teaches us, it teaches us about God's will. And again, and it always comes back to this, but at the, but at the end of the day, this tells us what to pray for and what not to pray for. Uh, but back to the example I gave with the Fort Knox thing, you know, you, you'll have some, as a matter of fact, I'll be more realistic. You have some people that are say, um, we have three viewers now I'm trying to see, wait till we got a little bit oh, more, but geez. yeah. <laughs> don't let it go to my, I'll try not to let it go to my head. Yeah. <laughs> I hope we get more than three, but, um, and I'm not saying you three are not important. I'm not saying that. <laughs> nope. But anyway, the fourth, um, viewer, the fourth viewer, we're gonna shower with praise. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, tell me about it. Um, but yeah, um, usually um, the atheists will get on me about, well, if God answers prayer, then why would He um, not answer the prayer about feeding the hungry over in Ethiopia or 
stopping this person from getting hit by a train when he goes, God, help me, before the train hits him and kills him. You know what I mean? Or, or, or one of those situations, well, well, why didn't the prayer that, that I might have done for my grandmother not die of cancer or something like that, why wasn't that prayer answered? And then they'll say, okay, that's the proof of your God not existing. Or your God's a jerk if he does exist because he chose not to answer those prayers. Hmm. Okay? I have, um, I have heard that point of view, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. But um, what I tell the atheists is, is this. Um, well, have you read the scriptures concerning this topic? Um, because, um, <clears throat> how can I put this? Um, there was an example when an atheist asked me, okay, if, if, if your God exists and you can pray to God and you can get whatever you want in prayer, then you should be able to pray for this person to be healed. Okay. Um, they, they'll give me an example when they was a Christian and they prayed for this person to be healed and they wasn't healed and whatnot. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I believe Jesus goes into this. Um, one of the disciples came to Jesus and, and was wondering why was this person um, um, lame when they couldn't see, and they thought and they thought it had something to do with sins. No, and Jesus said to, to, to that particular disciple, and I'm sorry I don't have the scriptures in front of me with this particular thing, but you can look you can look for it on Google. Jesus said to that particular disciple that that this person it wasn't sin, sin wasn't the reason why that person was like that. Rather, it was to bring glory to God, and at that particular time. Jesus healed that individual, and a lot of people gave God praise because that person um, was healed from this particular ailment. Why he doesn't do it today, I really don't know. Um, I trust that that, 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 that that whatever reasons, he chooses not to heal some people, and then he does heal other people. You know, um, just the right choice on his part. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I can I can see it from your point of view. Definitely, I was uh, I was a believer for for a number of years, and uh, so I mean, I do have I do have firsthand experience uh, believing in the power of prayer. And uh, but it it always can I ask you a question. Um, yes, absolutely. Uh, what which denomination did you come from? Um, I grew up in uh, a pretty strict uh, fundamental Pentecostal uh, household. Um, <laughs> Oh, I feel your pain, man. Uh, absolutely. Oh, man. <laughs> um, but I mean, as as I grew up, um, the, the restrictions kind of were uh, loosened a little bit, and I did manage to get to. Uh, it was uh, I went to a United Church, uh, and then it was kind of moved to a Universal Church, and I've uh, I've been kind of, uh, you know, on a on a definite journey uh, since then through through a lot of major religions and some you know some some major changes uh, to to settle where I am now. Um, but I, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm always, I'm always interested to, to look back at it uh, and, uh, and you know, remember exactly how I felt about it, and like, you know, it, it's, it's a good reminder to me to, to see, see how you guys are, are, are viewing it. You know, I, uh, I sometimes, I sometimes forget it. So. Uh, um, so let me ask you something. Um, yeah, sure. On your, on your uh, thingy there, and, and, and I know we spoke about this uh, before the, yeah. the Google Hangout started. You mentioned that you're an anti-theist, right? Yeah. Um, now, that is, sometimes this gets uh, misdefined. I, I don't want to say misdefined. That's sort of a misleading term, making it sound like I got the proper definition, right? Um, but I, the way I've always looked at it was kind of the way I heard Christopher Hitchens once describe it. He said, um, "I'm an anti-theist in the fact that I I think that all religions are basically this derivations on the same untrue, uh, un, the same untruth, basically that that were created." Uh, somehow horribly wrong, uh, and need and need them to to solve the problem of our of our existence. Uh, mm -hmm. And so in in, in in that way, wow. Uh, wow. Okay. So yeah. So I mean, wow. That's awesome. uh, so I mean, so in that way, I, I feel like um, I'm an anti-theist in the fact that I I think that. Uh, the realization that there probably is no God is a, a really uh, liberating uh, idea, and uh, and I try to uh, maybe spread it a little bit. So I guess I have a little bit of a, kind of a an atheist evangelist bent to it. I suppose would be the best way to, to describe I feel it. Bad. I think you have it. <laughs> yeah, I, I I would agree with that absolutely. Um, yeah, I I see it everywhere. I I try to be as honest about it as I can. That I'm I'm actually trying to to spread. The idea that um, there almost certainly is no God, um, because I do believe it's a, it's a useful one for moving forward uh, as, as a person. But I I definitely uh, try to try to remind myself that I was uh, exactly the same way, you know, as, as all these theists around you, as around me here, and uh, you know that uh, I try to I try not to forget that I was I was made I was believing the same thing, and I was I was exactly as smart as I am now, right? But uh, you know, it, it was uh, it was just the way I was looking at things. That's, 
I try to remind myself uh, how non-omniscient I am uh, on a regular basis. <laughs> All right, all right. So let's continue with the conversation and answer prayer, because then I want to kind of switch it with the questions and whatnot. Cool, cool. Because I, I wrote down uh, I wrote down the the the, the argument through answer to prayer here, and I uh, I'm just kind of gonna break it down what what how my notes go with it here, just to to kind of uh, just kind of clarify to my own mind here. So um the first uh, it basically it's an answer to who or what is God. Um you, that's how the conversation really starts, and then you say uh is God material or immaterial? Um, right. I, I don't think I have any problems with the answer that God is immaterial. Um, I, I understand why you're saying that. Uh, material would imply that we could we could sense it in some way. Um, clearly, you're not claiming that. So, immaterial is the other option um, that we kind of we, it's, it's sort of the, the, the negation of material, right? Um, right. So I, I understand that as the as the option. Um, I, I often heard uh, I also heard uh, Richard Carrier describe it as. Uh, Pure mind, meaning that uh, it's it's sort of uh, it's all kind of it can only be verified in the mind, right? We don't have anything uh, exterior in the or the reality around us to point to, let's say. Um, as far as uh, see, so that's that's where kind of where I, I kind of fall off, um, because as soon as we start saying uh, it's immaterial, like I understand where you're going with that, but then once we start saying, oh well, this immaterial thing has to interact somehow. With the material, uh, and that I think that the that interaction precludes a certain amount of material uh, material properties to to interact. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? Wow. Uh, uh, I don't. I, I hope I'm not I, over. I have analyzing. limitations. No, 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 no. It's, 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 you actually actually a fair question. I wish another atheist was here, or or somebody who was uh, scientific uh, savvy because um. When, when it comes to evolution <laughs> and how the immaterial yeah. interacts with the material world uh, and getting into that uh, from a natural sense, I am not the best person in the world to talk about this. I have found in my conversations with atheists that it's best to just admit that right off the back. Sure. That's why no, I have no guys problem. like Chewing Periodism or Nephilim Free or somebody here who can oh, go yeah, into them kind of thing. Okay, okay, well, um, then I guess... Let me see if he's doing my Skype. Right. Let me see if... Uh, Imperialism was on Skype. Um, nope. Uh, let me see if I can get Nephilim free. Hold on. The only problem is, is when, when when I bring these guys in, sometimes, sometimes, okay, neither one of them are on. Okay. Sometimes they just go on and on and on and on about the evolution and don't know when to stop. <laughs> yeah. And don't know when to stop. But they're very, very good at talking about these things. You know what I mean? But uh, me, yeah. I'm still studying, so. I don't want to try to pretend to know something I don't, you know. But I do want to say this, though. Okay, if you look at it from a Christian perspective, um, um, the God of the Bible, he created human beings, okay? And if you read in the Genesis account, God is actually having a relationship with, with Adam and then when he created Eve with Eve. You know what I mean? Um, and he's interacting with, like, with the animals, you know, and the fish and all the other things that he created. And when he finished creating everything, he called those things good. Okay, so 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 we see him interacting with the with the physical world. Okay, right. and yeah, I mean that I think that's yeah. I think that's the most confusing part is, is why we're why it seems so removed now um, when the interaction was so obvious then. Um, I mean, prayer could be answered because because God was so involved in in the material world. Um, right. Now I'm. I just realized now something. I'm, there is somebody yeah. I can invite. Mm. Are those other two atheists that you wanted to bring? Can can they actually come, or do they want to come in, or? Just one second. Uh, do you know who Galaxy Dreams is? No, never heard of them. I don't know if she's online. I'm gonna check. I'm gonna try. No, no, no. It's a woman. <laughs> uh, no, no, no messages from either of them. I'm gonna see if I can get her to come in. Okay, give me a second. Okay, go ahead and continue. Yeah, uh, yeah. So I then uh, so let's let's move on. Kind of, I I guess uh, between. I mean, we're talking about answered prayer being uh, the kind of the like the communication gap, the the bridge between the two. Um, between the two, it's kind of your, what you're pointing to as uh, proof of another existence above our own, the, the supernatural. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. So, um, 
in that case, uh, we're talking about uh, answered prayer being being the proof of that. Um, I noticed you use the analogy of gravity, um, but gravity, just because we don't see it, it still derives its um, properties from material being, right? Um, it is still a property of matter that that we can describe and measure. Um, so, it, are we are we talking about something that can be described, um, even though we don't observe it directly, or are we talking about uh, are we talking about something that happens more uh, ethereal? Well, gravity is um, something that we can't see. Gravity is something that we can't see with our eyes. I mean, it's, it's something that we can't feel with our hands. Gravity is something that um, that that I can't go and hug gravity. You know what I mean? I, 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 well, I, I think I think some, to me, yeah. I would consider it immaterial because it, it isn't something I can handle with my hands. You know what I mean? Um, um, I can feel air blowing through my blowing through my um, um, blowing on my hands. I I I can um, I, I can breathe in air going and I can feel it going through my lungs, going in and out of my lungs. But when it comes to gravity, the only thing I got for gravity is what comes up. You know, must come down. <laughs> if I jump up, I'm gonna fall down. You know what I mean? That's why I consider gravity to be immaterial. And one of my uh, favorite examples to use uh, uh, for the proof that we know that gravity is real. You know. Um, I hope that helps. I don't know because I'm not less, like I said. When it comes to science, I am not the best person to uh, have this conversation with. <laughs> See, I I think I think maybe um, you say that you you don't experience gravity, but we, we don't we never I mean as as normal humans we never really get outside of the experience of experiencing gravity. Do you, you see what I'm saying? We never. I'm sure if you went to space and came back, you would say. Oh, we're all experiencing gravity, um, and I think I think good proof of that is um, old people sag, right? Uh, we all eventually uh, sag towards the ground, right? I mean, that's that's, that's proof enough, I think, of gravity. Yeah, gravity, uh, gravity, gravity, gravity and that, is constantly pulling us down, and that we're yeah, that we're constantly feeling it, and uh, just yeah. that, just because that experience is normal, that not necessarily, doesn't necessarily mean that we don't experience it, right? Okay. Well, I, okay, that's that's a uh, that's that's an interesting uh, an interesting way of, of putting it. I like I like the analogy definitely. Um, it puts it sort of in a in a, in a certain um, in a certain light that uh, allows me kind of the possibility of uh, examining if prayer uh, is a force that we can uh, we can measure. Do you see what I'm saying? Um, yeah, yeah. I guess I guess that's I guess that's kind of where where I kind of lose it, right? I mean, we we go to the third premise where um, you have a prayer journal um, uh, now. This is this is kind of where uh, I I feel like um, a little bit of there's there's definitely going to be a, a slight confirmation bias um, okay. when it comes to uh, the, the the analysis of a of a prayer journal um, and I think I think there's a few different reasons for that um, and if you just let me explain them I'll I'll go through them here um, I okay. think the first one is is that um, when you when you ask for prayer uh, when you ask a prayer request of God. You you right. right away eliminate your request from the absolute impossible. Um, so you never you you right away eliminate all the possible things you could ask God for. Um, and I think in I'm that sorry, process, say that again. You you eliminate all the possibilities that you could ask God for, or that you that you could ask God for but don't um, could never uh, exist, right? Or could never come to be. Do you, you see what I'm saying? Like I'm not going to ask God for uh, I think so. a giant. Uh, jelly cake because um, that the giant jelly cake's not gonna just suddenly appear in front of me. That I wouldn't I wouldn't ask for that. Right. So that that makes sense, right? And then uh, you also have this elimination where you're not gonna ask for the negative of an out of a of a situation to occur. Um, it would be interesting if if people began to pray for the opposite of what they wanted and then find out if that had an effect on uh, what they got. Um, well, actually, you, you, you would be yeah. surprised how many of us do pray. Uh, okay, like, like for example, there's a lot of Christians right now that's, that 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 is praying, and and I gotta be careful how I say this. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> there are a lot of Christians right now that I am aware of that are praying for the destruction of the for, of, of the destruction uh, or the judgment rather of the, of, of uh, several countries in this world. <laughs> <laughs> They're on their knees asking, saying, God, you know, look at the sin of this country. I pray, Lord, that you will pour your judgment down on this particular nation. You know what I mean? And, you, and, and you'll see that those, a lot of those prayers are not answered. 
And the reason why it, 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 those prayers are not answered, because a lot of times um, people get emotional about what's going on in the world, and they forget about what's actually taught in the scriptures, and they'll start going ahead of God and start asking for things that, that God is simply not going to do right now. Right, right. You know well, what I mean? So, yeah, absolutely. I, I feel there is there is a little bit of a probably emotional bias maybe in the asking of things. You probably might might even ask things that are actually impossible, um, yeah. even though uh, or unlikely, anyways. And then even though you know that they probably won't happen, or or maybe with the maybe with the idea that that it's it's impossible, um, and that's why you're asking for it. Or you, like uh, well, I'm a little confused as as to the well again. Well, again, uh, m most of the time when, 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 when Christians get on their knees and they ask God really for anything, we usually in a and, – and when I say ask God for anything, I mean like uh, either for ourselves, for someone else. Usually, you know, because people are so proudful, when people are, are, are so self-sufficient, rather, I would use that phrase just a little better. Um, usually we're, we're so self-sufficient, we don't want to ask God for anything. We want to try to do it ourselves. So usually we have to be in 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 a uh, impossible situation like myself. A lot of times I'll, I'll I won't ask God for money until I know I don't have it. My friends don't have it. The people in my circle don't have it, and I've asked everybody I could possibly ask. You know what I mean? And I I would consider that an impossible situation. I get on my knees and say, Lord, you know, um 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 I I I really need to go here. You know what I mean? Take care of my business. Uh, uh, at this government place or whatever, um, nobody has no money, and, and, I, and I need car fare to get there. You know what I mean? And I can pray, and I can ask him to provide for me, and he will provide. Hmm. Usually by blessing somebody else with some money so that they can share some with me. Now, some people will be like, um, and that's a very selfish thing about God. He'll, he'll give, you know, little, he'll give G-man money, but he won't go out there and feed somebody in Ethiopia. And if I can say this um, very quickly, um, I find that the same people that say that, they themselves are not giving no one nothing in Ethiopia to eat. So they're not really concerned about the person in Ethiopia not eating. They're only concerned about destroying the argument that they're trying to make. You know what I mean? They're not being honest about it. I agree. Okay. Yeah, I know that's, that's, uh, that's an absolute good point. I agree. All right. Well, cool. Um, well, then it comes to my, my second way that I feel like the, the prayer journal could be, could be biased in some way. Um, there, now there's there's the there's the well-known idea of of people forgetting the losses and remembering the wins. Um, it's uh it's, it's been kind of observed in, in a lot of laboratory experiments uh, and and also a lot, a lot of uh, psych, psychology experiments um, that where human beings are actually very bad at re remembering uh, when things don't work and very good at remembering when things do work. And we kind of will develop. Uh, it's, it's one of the major reasons that people develop. Um, What's the word uh, when you when you believe in luck uh, superstitions when you when you when, uh, people develop very very odd superstitions uh, and you'll notice that it's very personalized to the person and it's because we're very easily uh, convinced that uh, uh, something that correlates to our win is the actual reason for that win. So do you see what I'm saying? Um, happens in mm -hmm. gamblers a lot, and uh, I mean I as a as a former uh, pretty uh, blackjack player, I I know that you. You do tend to uh, forget your losses very easily, uh, and you you tend to report your wins uh, very highly, uh, even just in your own brain a lot of times, uh, so that you kind of you kind of uh, break even in your mind, even if you are way down. Um, and I think uh, I think that's it's maybe a, a pretty common coping mechanism among among human beings. So I, I don't I don't I think that I think that might that might throw uh, a little bit of uh, just a little bit of skepticism on your prayer journal as as far as uh, being inaccurate. Uh, description of of the the proof of anti prayer. You see what I'm saying? Sorry, I, I well, I can see why some skeptics would have a, would have a problem with a a prayer journal because they're not actually there themselves watching me pray. They're not there watching me, you know, write down the prayer request. Yeah, I can understand I, what you mean. What you mean by that? Right, but I I, I mean even more uh, as proof for yourself. Um, because I because I would never I would never attempt to discount your personal experience, but only suggests that um, that your experience can be skewed by the by these tendencies to uh, remember uh, when you win more often than when you lose. Hmm. I'd like to congratulate you on something. Uh, uh, that's a very interesting point that you made about the, uh, about the, about a potential bias with the prayer journal because um, that's interesting because you you can have somebody lie and write down um, 
something in a prayer journal that's not true. There, you there know what I mean? And they can say that God did this for me and God never did it. And that stuff is going on out there. Yeah, yeah. exactly. But, I, I'm um, at the same time, though, that person can... No, yeah, no, go ahead. I would, I would worry, I would worry that that person would be inclined to uh, report uh, their prayers as more answered than than uh, than not. Um, uh, but but mm -hmm. that I, I think that I would take the prayer journal on the face value and and more look at um, is their experience of it accurate. And I think I think that's a more that's a more fruitful kind of way of, of looking at it. Maybe just as a personal uh, skepticism uh, exercise. Well, that's fair. And, and once again, I'd like to congratulate you with that. And I wish the atheists that are watching this would actually uh, uh, um, actually learn something from what you just asked. Um, but uh, I would like to say this, though. Um, while there is a possibility that the bias could be in a per journal, how would you feel about, um, if, let's say, for example, you had some Christian friends. I mean, you yourself are an anti-theist. You had some Christian friends, and they wanted to pray for you, but they prayed right in front of you. And then they wrote down in the prayer journal what they prayed. I mean, you was a witness, you were there, and, and you would have seen. And then let's just say the prayer was answered. As an anti-theist or an atheist, for those of you who are watching this, um, even the atheist can say, well, that was coincidence, or it was going to happen anyway, or something like that. But at least you was there. You know what I mean? You got to hear us, or, uh, whether it's a us or an individual, pray to God for your particular situation. Like, let's, for example, I, I might pray that. Um, that your grandmother um, get healed of uh, 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 the small case of cancer that she might have in her in, in her throat or something. You know what I mean? And then it turned out the cancer wasn't there no more. Could there be a scientific explanation on 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 how the cancer disappeared? Yes, but at the same time, you also have to take into an account that God used whatever that scientific explanation was to heal the um the, the cancer that could be in your throat. You understand what I'm saying? I do. I, I think do. that's um, just as fair. That's just as fair as you saying that it could be biased in the uh, in the prayer journal. Because the truth of the matter is, you got some dishonest people out there that do stuff like that. Right. Right. Uh, yeah. I mean, I think it, it kind of cuts to the chase a little bit to just admit that maybe um, experience isn't as as, uh, as solid of a, of a of a kind of a material uh, evidence as as we kind of. We kind of sometimes suggest, um, and I, I agree. It's the only probably way we can we can get to uh, what is reality, right? So I I don't I don't try to I don't try to say that we can't know um, what uh, what our experiences are or anything like anything any weird nihilistic claim or anything like that. But but I uh, I take I take your point. Absolutely. Very it's very uh, it's very. Well, let me ask you a question. Thing. I'd like to ask you a question. Um, sure. As an anti-theist, I mean, obviously at some point you, you, you said at one time in your life that, that you was a Christian, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you grew up in a, um, in a pretty hardcore um, Pentecostal, um, in a pretty hardcore Absolutely. Pentecostal home and whatnot, and I'm assuming when you got older you, you, you kept the faith as well before you finally lost it. Um, was it a personal experience that made you lose your faith, or was it, um, or was it uh, some hard questions that you started to ask yourself, or was it... Um, I mean, for the atheist viewers that are out there, you know what I mean. What 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 made you? And I'm curious myself too. What made you lose your faith that God actually exists? That you started believing that um, that you believe is all a bunch of fantasy or whatever. Sure. Well, I'm I'm not sure if I could say I, I lost my faith. Um, I I think I was always very very skeptical um, when I was growing up. Um, and uh, I mean, I, I was kind of was a little bit of the the mouthy kind of smart. Uh, mouth. My dad used to call me a smart aleck all the time. You know, he was. He was constantly reaching behind the, the behind the seat uh, on our way to church, uh, to, you know, grab my leg and get me to get me to be quiet and stop reading out from the Bible. Um, but the, I I think uh, I think really what kind of pushed me over the edge was um, I, I went to a very uh, a very almost strict uh, um, uh, Christian academy also um, with my schooling. So there was a lot. I I was having this message reinforced over and over in my head um, and. Uh, I think suddenly realizing that there was a lot more uh, points of view out there, um, kind of kind of put it into my head that I needed to at least um, understand uh, as many points of view as possible before I um, made my decision as I had, uh, you know, in my early teens. Um, so, 
So as fervent as I was and as, and as dedicated as I was to uh, reading the Bible and following God's Word, and uh, you know, I was, I was trying to be a very active member in my church and everything, um, I, I felt like I needed to get as much information about uh, other religions and points of view as possible. Um, and, and it seemed to uh, clash uh, with, with the messages that I was getting um, from everybody around me, right? Uh, from my teachers and my church, you know, youth group and everything like that. And uh, the more questions I asked, the, the more I felt like they were saying, you shouldn't be asking, you can ask these questions, but you shouldn't be asking them here uh, with everybody listening uh, because that's dangerous. And it seemed, it seemed like a, a weak position. That, that's really, that's really, I think, what, what pushed me. Uh, about 17, I decided, um, okay, well, I think maybe I'll, I'll step away from maybe being an active member of the church, but I, I, it took me a few more years to really acknowledge that I was no longer a Christian. Uh, and I think that's, that's a tough thing to, to get rid of when you've grown up in, the, in that community. And how did your family take it? Um, they were uh, heartbroken, but I, I don't think they were surprised. I was, I was kind of a black sheep, like I said. I mean, I was, I was kind of that one who was asking questions. And I think they knew that I was kind of headed that direction. Um, we had that talk about a year ago, uh, and uh, yeah, my, my mom and dad were not very impressed. I know my dad, uh, he, he's, he's very much like me, so he attempted a few uh, arguments on me, but I, by that time I had been reading so much and uh, had, had heard those arguments before, and, and uh, so there was, it wasn't really uh, very compelling at that point. Um, my mother didn't take it very well. She... Uh, there was definitely a few tears, um, you know, uh, the you know the insinuation that I had broken her heart and that like this was this was really killing her. But we're on great terms now, and she knows that uh, no matter what I believe about uh, her deity, I still love her as a as a as person, and uh, you know, as my mother, she's 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 still the same person she was before, just like I'm the same person now, right? Well, let me ask you something then. Um, with saying with, with with that being said, how do you feel about all these other atheists that are on YouTube? You know, just brutally attacking Christians on YouTube, I, I think and, then, we, and then and then and then what cracks me up is while they're attacking us, they get mad and hostile when we actually have some things to say about them. <laughs> yeah, I think I think a lot of it is. I mean, we're we're kind of you know we're hitting each other with our left hands while we're trying. You know, we're we're protesting with our right a lot of times. Um, it does seem like our our community kind of is a little bit divided. Um, even just amongst what we think is a proper technique for interacting with um, theists and uh, and other other YouTube users, um, I think Hangouts is a good uh, start, kind of, to get us kind of maybe conversing more on a face-to-face -face basis and seeing the sincerity on each other's face, anyways, when we're when we're talking with each other. I think uh, the YouTube comments and uh, and Twitter and and things like that, uh, they're they're useful for small uh, messages. I, I don't feel like they they really uh, progress uh, the conversation further or, or really really allow us to uh, get into a, a real profitable dialogue for, for learning about each other. Um, and I think that's I think that's what we're what we're missing right now is is a real sense of um, that we're talking to other people and that we really need to understand these people as, are just human beings just like us and and there we're we're all uh, able to be wrong, uh, and so it, it, as soon as we acknowledge that, we can just, you know, we can just be all right. Like that's fine, you know. We, you think your way, I think mine, and you know, as much as as we disagree, I, I don't think that's a reason to be uh, hateful or or to be to be kind of going on these odd ha uh, uh, these uh, ad hominem attacks and all that stuff. It does seem like we're we're getting off track here, very very much so. So, mm -hmm. but you know what? That was excellent that you said that. that. God forbid some of us might actually be wrong, you know. Uh, I, yeah, I uh, it, it it kind of it, I kind of get a little bit uh, a little bit of a chuckle when I mean I know I know the uh, the idea of presenting your your position is to kind of present it in a convincing way and that kind of includes a certain amount of confidence. But I think right um, I think deep down you need to, you need to accept that there is this possibility of of your being wrong about about very very basic things and uh, and even you know very. Uh, Minute details can be can be very important when you when you look at them from a different point of view. And I uh, think that. No, oh, I agree. Really, I agree. Yeah. And, and and anybody that just believes every Tom, Dick, and Harry that comes at them and tell them something is it, gullible. It's yeah, utterly absolutely. gullible. Um, and, and 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 it's not just in the atheist circles; it's in Christian circles too. 
You know, the pastor goes up there and preaches a sermon. You know what I mean? And, and, and everybody's going, oh, oh, my pastor's right. He's never wrong. He would never steer me the wrong way. You know, yes, he will steer you the wrong way. Then not everybody is seeking after your good. So I, yeah. I, I, I completely get what you're saying, you know, that we're yeah, not supposed I, to be gullible. We should check out the information that we're getting to see whether or not that information is true. I'm, I'm, and I'm very sympathetic to that, that point of view. Um, I, know, I know how it can kind of feel to, to feel that uh, security of having the authority figure being the arbiter of, of what is right and wrong for you. Um, and that can, feel, that can be, feel very, very secure. And uh, when you remove that, there can be this, this kind of anxiety about uh, not knowing now what, what is right and wrong. But I, I think uh, that trust can be misplaced very easily. And uh, I think uh, authority figures need constant vetting of their information that they're feeding. I think it's very important to uh, be constantly um, skeptical of what someone says to you. And I think that's, that's, that's kind of where I come from with it. I, I think I feel like you're, you're kind of on the same page with that. Yeah, yeah. But, but, but I got a, uh, another question I'd like to ask you. Um, did you see when I call the atheist experience? Did uh, you see any I, of those videos on YouTube? I think I did. Um, I might I might not have been paying. It didn't seem like you were on for very long, uh, if I remember correctly. I wasn't. <laughs> I was only about like uh, nine minutes, I think. I don't even think it was that long. Uh, me and Matt Dillahunty, uh I was supposed to be presenting my evidence of answered prayer uh, that that God exists on his on his uh, atheist experience. But yeah. um, what happened was uh, I had responded to a video that Cult of Dusty did when he was saying that black Christians were Uncle Tom's, okay? And he was saying that we support slavery, okay? And I made a video trying to correct um, Cult of Dusty on that particular topic. One of those emotional things without actually um, doing a full Bible study. I did a partial Bible study. And Matt Dillahunty saw this particular video, and he commented on it and would not drop the issue. I said, this, this is nothing to do with you. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, um, and and I tried my best to answer his questions and whatnot. Then I called the atheist experience, and he brought it back up. Yeah, I'll, you I'll, know defend, what I mean? I'll and, defend Matt Dillahunty's ability to control the content of the atheist experience. He is one of the hosts there. And I, I will. I mean, he, he does have control, I suppose, in, in a way. But that was it was kind of a dismissive way of doing it, saying, if you won't uh, agree that you were wrong, then we have nothing else to do. Yeah, that's sort of a. I think that's a, maybe a dishonest tactic. Um, I don't know if he was if he was trying to get out of it or or if he if he actually felt with conviction that that's that's the best way to proceed. But I thought I thought he could have moved on um, very easily and just just you know accepted that you weren't you weren't going to uh, admit to any any wrongdoing. Um, so I, I, in <laughs> some way more. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and furthermore, it from a Christian from a Christian perspective. He, he 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 really helped me a lot. He just don't. I I I almost want to call there again because that's how much he helped yeah. me on YouTube. Well, oh God, man. I don't. He, I don't he, think. I don't think censorship uh, actually um, solves any. If anything, it usually backfires on people. Um, on especially in the YouTube community, uh, we we pick up on um, people being uh, censored very very easily. Um, the, the word kind of spreads on it, and we all we all don't uh, appreciate uh, censorship, I believe. So I think there's I think there's a very oh, YouTube has it has kind of a built-in community backlash that can kind of uh, occur if you if you censor like that, uh, and it can it can only add popularity to the person you're trying to censor. That's that's usually what ends up well, happening. So. pop is not the uh, is, is not the issue with where I'm saying maybe maybe, maybe not popularity uh, awareness would be a, probably a better way of putting it. Uh, viewership would be would be the, the most important well, thing. Well, viewership or, or um, he helped me in the sense that now when I talk to atheists about this, they already have this preconceived notion in their head about what they think I think about um, about slavery, and they're going to refer to Matt Dillahunty and what happened to the atheist experience. Well, when I say he helped me with this is because when they come to me, they're going to come to me in ignorance, and it's going to be able to prove some of the arguments that I made on my channel. When, when, whenever you get the chance, just listen to some of the things that I say about atheism, and you'll completely understand sure. what well, I'm yeah, talking I know. about. Never underestimate the power of surprise, right? Uh, very, uh, <laughs> yeah. the powerful tool. <laughs> yeah, um, definitely. Well, yeah, uh, so, I mean, I'm, uh, I, don't know, I don't know if I'm really interested in, in tackling the, the, the slavery issue from you, just because I don't know. I know it's a very nuanced issue, and I don't want to, I don't want to kind of, Go into it kind of without any uh, basic uh, understanding of your position on that. Um, Can you, I give you the nutshell? It's on your channel, right? Yeah. Let's, oh let's, yeah. Let's no, it's, I'll give you the, the 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 nutshell about what the Bible teaches about slavery. Okay. Sure. Um, 
whatever you obey will become your master. That's slavery in a nutshell in the Bible. Now, a lot of the atheists will watch my, my, my channel and see me talking about like bits and pieces of what slavery is on, 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 on my channel and some of the things that I said on the atheist experience. But what they don't understand is my overall view on the subject is, is whoever you obey or whatever you obey, that's very important, becomes your master. For example, I have said to atheists that, that they are slaves to doubt. Because I have – now, this is not true. Let me say this right now. This is not true about all atheists. I'm talking to you right now, and I don't necessarily think that's true about you. There sure, are some no, other no, atheists. I'm, not, absolutely. I'm taking it as a general atheist. Uh, the yeah, label atheist. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like Lee Lemon is not – Lee Lemon will actually sure. listen to you when you talk to her and whatnot. And there's other people on YouTube that, that are not what I would call slaves of doubt. But the majority of the atheists that I come in contact with on my channel – they doubt everything. They doubt the existence of Jesus, the existence of God. They doubt the Bible. They doubt the authors of the Bible. They doubt Shakespeare. They doubt any other book <laughs> that, that, that they have never read. They doubt everything. So I say to them, listen, doubt is your master. You are a slave to doubt. Or I'll say that you're a slave to sin. Or I'll say that you're a slave to various different things. And they'll be like, oh, you know what you're talking about with slavery? And get into this big, giant misunderstanding of, 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 of the topic when they don't understand where my views are with this particular matter. And I would love to have Matt Dillon, honey, at this Google Hangout to explain that to him. Not so that I can control him or yell at him, but to explain to him my full view on the matter and not him just going, I disagree with you, I'm hanging up. Yeah, I, I, it, wasn't, it wasn't a constructive way of dealing with it. But, I, but again, I don't, I, don't, I don't necessarily agree with how he handled this, but I will defend his ability to control the content of his channel. I, it's too bad that, that he chose it that way. Yeah, but it's too bad. So, <laughs> yeah, um, so I, I, I definitely, uh, I kind of see where you're coming from with that a little bit. Um, now, w with the whole slavery issue, are, are you defending uh, the, the idea of, of slavery in the Bible as being something different? Because I have, I have kind of heard uh, that argument sort of before. Is, you say, you're kind of calling it more of an indentured, uh, indentured servitude uh, instead, of, instead of slavery, or are we... Okay, let me say two using, things. Sure. Well, two, two or three things. Number one, I don't so I don't um agree that um okay I don't support slavery, but I'm gonna sound like I'm contradicting myself in a minute, and you'll see why in a minute. I don't support it because obviously I'm an African American. I've seen what happened in uh in this country uh you know a couple of hundred years ago. Um, right. But here's the thing: slavery, the the slavery that we see here in the transatlantic um in, in the transatlantic uh, slave trade here in in, in the states and or Africa and these other countries that are around us and whatnot. Um, get the Jews first. When whenever a, a Jewish became a slave to one to their debtor, it's because they could not be. They, it's because they could not pay their bills. They could not. Um, Sorry, you, uh, broke, you broke up that that last sentence there. Uh, you broke up at the beginning of it. Uh, what was that? What was that line you said? Uh, it was, you you held up your two two fingers. What was that? Um, um, that 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 there's a difference between the, the difference transatlantic between. slave trade, yeah, and what you see in the Bible, because right. because a Jewish person could sell himself into slavery to be able to pay off his debts, pretty much in a nutshell. Now, here's the thing: there's another part in the scriptures, and, and we got six viewers right now, and I want to make sure I say this because if I don't, they're going to remind me about other passages in scripture where God is telling the children of Israel they go into these various different enemy lands that they can take slaves for themselves. And what I, I like to say to the atheists is this. Number one, um, God, God isn't, by God telling the, 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 the children of Israel to, to go into those lands and, and take slaves for themselves, he's not telling them, look, I support slavery. That's not what he's doing. God is taking something that was already in existence already, okay, and he's kind of like um, kind of making regulations for it. You know what I mean? He's telling you, look, you're going to war with this nation. If you beat them in war, you can take these women for yourselves. Now, here's the thing that a lot of atheists don't understand about, about this particular matter. They also have to obey the other 612 laws that are found in the Old Testament. They can't contradict them, meaning they can't get these women and start like getting knives and cutting them open and all this stuff. And what He can't do that. because Then they would be breaking the rest of the law. They would have to love their neighbor the way they love themselves and love the Lord their God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. Okay? And 
there's a couple of other scriptures in there where it says that um well Mac Dillon Honey said something about um I don't know if it was Deuteronomy twenty two. I forget the the uh the, the exact scripture he used, but he was talking about how there was a quote unquote loophole in the Bible where 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 after seven years this person could continue to be a slave if he got married to um or if he wasn't married or something like that. And and I was trying to tell people was that that, that was not a loophole. <laughs> there, there was no loophole there. The, it, the scripture actually says that if, that if he loves his master, he can stay with his master. And again, that's a different society and a different civilization back then. It was under a, um, um, what do you call it? It, it was under a, um, a, a, a theocracy. We're under a, de a democracy. So it's very hard for us to understand the, 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 the culture that they was living in versus the culture that we're living in today. You understand what I'm saying? So, so atheists just can't come out and just say, you know, it, oh, that's just terrible, and that's wrong. Well, you never lived in that society. How do you know what 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 would be wrong in, in in that particular society if you never lived there before? I uh I would I would agree with that actually. Um, I I kind of do. Uh, my ears kind of perk up a little bit when I hear kind of people describe, uh, well, they were doing it back then, and that's horrible. Um, I think I I do. Why why I think from our point of view that is that is truly horrible. I don't think that. Uh, Humans should own other humans. Um, I I do see your concern and the worry that we're we're kind of looking at it from sort of an afro uh, like an anthrocentric uh, that that how it would be and uh, an anthrocentric kind of uh, way where our art the people from our time are way more advanced and you know people from from that time are are a little less so right and I don't I worry sometimes I worry that that might be maybe we're not giving the people back then enough credit. Um, that they they maybe could have figured that out if 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 uh, if, if they hadn't been directed in the wrong way. Um, so I, that that's sort of my concern. I don't know if this is off the topic. topic. Yeah. Yeah. Like I don't see. I don't know. I don't like, know if this is off. Of sure. Yeah. No. I'm sorry. There's a little bit of delay there. No. Um, no. 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 Go ahead. You was in the middle of saying something. Go ahead. I think yeah, we have a little bit of I, lag here. So yeah, I'm gonna let you finish. I think, go ahead. I think that's true. Thank you very much. Um, and I feel I feel like maybe there's. In my, in my, uh, I worry that when we, when we say something like, "Oh, well, it was okay for that time," that we're not giving those people enough credit as, as uh, conscious, thinking, reasonable humans, um, that they couldn't have figured it out, right? And I think that I worry that we're not, I, you know, and I do see your point that we can't necessarily point or paint them with the same brush as we would somebody acting uh, in the current uh, state of knowledge that that humans are in now. Um, but I, I worry that we're excusing them maybe a little bit uh, off the cuff, um, not giving them enough personal responsibility for their actions just because of their ignorance. Do you, do you see what I'm saying about that? I don't. No, I, 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 I completely get what you're saying. I run into a lot of atheists that say that, uh, or rather that I treat the people uh, in, the, in the biblical times as being sheep herders and not knowing anything. But, but can I share something with you that I've learned recently about evolution? Sure. Um, in case you don't know, for example, I, I like to let the viewers know this too. I, I am not the sharpest knife in the drawer when it comes to um, when it comes to the subject of evolution, but I have been studying it, and I do have a better basic understanding of it than I did uh, in previous months. I won't go into a lot, but but I will say this: I have learned, and I actually have proof of this, that these so-called sheep herders were actually the first ones to um, start understanding what evolution was. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Um, um, the uh, the idea of, of uh, artificial selection is actually one of uh, Darwin's first proofs, or, or one of his first clues that uh, that uh, selection happens naturally in, in the wild. Um, and uh, he does cite the, the yeah. fact that they, they kind of chose from amongst them the best and realized that they had to breed, breed those with uh, the best, you know, between the best pairs um, in order to get get the high quality uh, um, uh, uh, produce that they were that they were getting. Mm, mm, mm. Um, uh, were you but, going? Were you going along those lines, or? The, uh, yeah, it's 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 uh, I think it's interesting that that these so-called sheep herders, <laughs> as the atheist community likes to yeah. call them, uh, were were not as dumb as um, were not as dumb as uh, as the atheists on YouTube like to say they are. Um, they uh, as a matter of fact, the Egyptians, if I'm not mistaken, uh, was one of the first to be able to um to 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 make the argument about um. About evolution over um over the existence of God, uh, but 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 it's kind of funny though considering they considered their pharaohs to be a god at the same time. 
But I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. I want to save that <laughs> later. <laughs> I'm still studying, you know, because uh, when I do get into this conversation, and I really want to get into it, I want to make sure I know what I'm talking about. So, you know, I got I got to check my sources <laughs> to see whether or not they was accurate. You know, I can talk about answered prayer because I because I'm a, because I'm I, I'm informed about that particular thing. But when it comes to evolution and with something I don't know that much about, from, from this point forward, when I'm talking to an atheist, staying away from it. I'm not talking about it. Sure. The, um, I was I was curious. Do you have any like uh, uh, academic papers or, or research um, that that's gone on with uh, prayer uh, being answered, or do we do we have any, any research papers? that's coming? Because I, I have heard no. I have heard of a bit, um, but it's always been really small sample sizing. So I'm I'm always a little bit skeptical when I when I hear when I hear of a. Uh, of results. I've heard uh, going, somebody going either way. I've heard some atheists tell me that they um, that they've seen a study and they, they they said that prayer was that they had like 25 people in a room or 50 people in a room and they all prayed and like maybe 10 percent of the prayers were actually answered. Why the other 90 percent wasn't? Uh, I've heard another story where someone told me that 50 percent of the prayers were answered. Uh, another story where like and, and the number either gets bigger or smaller, but it's never like 100 percent of the people of, of the prayers were ever answered. When they try to do a so-called scientific study, I'm still trying to find the study that they're speaking about. I think um, the atheist that first told me about this, I, and don't quote me on this because I could be wrong. I don't know if it was Griffin 9857 or uh, Suzuki Das on YouTube. If it ain't them, then I don't remember who the atheist was that actually uh, that actually told me about this. But um, but the fact of the matter is, the study was done. And there was a certain amount of the prayers that was answered. And I like to tell the atheists that even if 1% was answered, that's evidence. And I think, and, and, and I also like to point this out about evidence, too. I know that a lot of people have different definitions for their words. I have a definition here for me, the actual dictionary di uh, definition of what evidence is. But um, when I think of evidence, I think of like, um, I don't know, when we when, when, when see a crime scene and you're trying to find out what happened, and a person might find... Um, you know, a stranded bullet, a bullet that might have hit the wall and hit the ground. That's evidence that a crime happened. If you see glass inside of the house or outside of the house, you can determine that a break-in happened. But in order to determine whether or not the person broke in or broke out, it depends where the glass is. You understand what I'm saying? So that would be evidence that a break-in happened or a break-out happened. You know what I mean? Right. So my understanding of evidence is you have to look. You have to listen to what the person is saying. Uh, you have to look at the percentages that the person is presenting to you. And you have to take that into consideration. There are a lot of Christians in the world. There are a lot of Muslims in the world. There are a lot of people who practice religion and say that prayer works. You have a very small population that says that prayer does not work. Who are you going to listen to? Or at least, bare minimum, treat it as evidence. Whether or not it's good evidence or bad evidence is going to determine by listening to the rest of the argument. You know what I mean? Yeah, I, I, I kind of get what you're saying. Um... I, I think maybe where where I lose you is um, when we're when we're talking about evidence, uh, it always demands a certain level of uh, analytical uh, processing in order to determine if it's good evidence or bad evidence, um, as, as in uh, points to a, a true conclusion or or uh, or leads to a false conclusion about uh, what actually happened. Um, and so I think that's when we're when we're talking to people and we're and we're we're getting their uh, experience. Like you're right in the fact that we can't. It's just like the, you know the, where the glass is, uh, on which side of the window the glass is, is the evidence. And I think that person's experience is the evidence that is there. Uh, we are analyzing that evidence. I think in the analyzing process is where I think we we kind of lose each other um, because I'm analyzing it as um, he could be mistaken, uh, uh, and so. If, if he gives me a uh, like a supernatural claim or something that is is not a believable claim for me, um, I immediately my analyzing requires a certain level of corroborating evidence to support that uh, that kind of proposition um, that we're trying to point to with that evidence. Um, I hope that's not getting mm. too convoluted. Um, so I'm, I think there's a level that's oh, no, missing okay. kind of in the process there. Uh, that we need to we need to analyze what is there, and then it and then we kind of uh, also have to kind of corroborate it with the rest of the scene. Also, there is there is that kind of contextual uh, nest to that to that evidence. You know, that window being broken may be evidence of the crime, but it could also be unrelated to the crime. And the, the real evidence of the crime is you know uh, a fingerprint that's on the back door or a back doorknob, right? So we 
we we analyze the evidence as good um, based on if it if it points to the to the conclusion that actually happened. Um, so I think I think sometimes experience can be that evidence, but it, it's how we analyze it that uh, that kind of determines what how good or bad and, that experience. And, can be. and you have to be honest about it as well. So I I, I would agree with you there. You know what yeah, I mean? There's, there's also that level. honesty you bring it to it. There's also that level of, of, of trust that you're that you're bringing to that source that you're you're trying to confirm, right? So there is there is also that, and I and I can I can definitely uh, you know relate to that that kind of gut feeling that you have uh, when it comes to trusting people or, or sources. And if I can use you as an example, you're you're an atheist, okay? You don't believe in the existence of God, okay? That's right. Um, but but before you came to that conclusion. There, 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 there has to be a certain amount of um, there has to be a certain amount of uh, evidence for you, uh, whether it be physical, logical. Um, I, I, I want to say the p word, but I can't even pronounce it. Let me try it. Uh, uh, philosophy, I guess. I want to say logical. Yeah, yeah philosophically. Yeah, there has to be a certain amount of evidence for you to be able to say, you know what, guys, I don't believe that God exists, and this is why. But there has to be more than, well, I'm listening to the Christian argument, and I just don't believe it. There has to be more to it than that. There has to be some logical reason there. And a lot of times I'll, I'll, I'll go to the atheist community and I'll ask them, well, what, what proof do you have that God does not exist? And what they'll say to me immediately, almost immediately, is this. They'll go, uh, it's, it's, it's not my place to give you evidence to, uh, uh, for the non-existence of God. You must try to convince me that God exists. I have better things to do with my day. <laughs> Yeah. Then um, argue with somebody about that all day. All I wanted to know is why don't you believe? <laughs> if you don't want yeah, to tell I, me, I'm going about my business. You absolutely, know. Absolutely. Absolutely. I I, uh, I can agree with that. Um, I think sometimes the YouTube community can be unnecessarily confrontational. Um, and I I don't know if people mean it mean it to be personal. Um, or or even um are actually reacting to you necessarily in your interactions with them. Um. I think a lot of it is the fact that they're over, you know, the really famous ones, um, the ones putting out really uh, very, you know, controversial videos, are can be overwhelmed sometimes. I think with the amount of attention they receive, mm -hmm. um, and you know, just the nature of of YouTube that you know, it, it suddenly ten thousand people are emailing you the exact same question, and I think you can. Get, I'm sure. I'm sure that's happened to you. Uh, Not you know, ten thousand, and I. I do know yeah, what it's like a bunch absolutely. of hitting. I think emailing me all the time. Oh lord. Mm -hmm. And and it's probably a lot of the same points, and you end up addressing the same argument over and over. And I think <laughs> we sometimes we judge people's we 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 judge people's uh, reaction to uh, questions in public forums uh, maybe a little prematurely because we don't consider that they've actually you know dealt with this they've dealt with this five thousand times already you know that they they're trying to cut to the chase they're not trying to be rude they're just they or have already heard this question, and they really they feel like they they want to uh, address it quickly and move on, right? And I think sometimes we yeah. kind of take that as frustration, or we we think that we're we're getting to them, or like they're they're starting to crack under the pressure. But I, I think maybe we're misinterpreting it, and it's more of a it's more of a, a reaction to just just the the sheer amount that you're that you're dealing with, and you know, and and some, sometimes the nature of the topics that we we end up covering uh, as a result. You know what? Uh, this is a really good conversation that me and you are having. <laughs> well, thanks. Um, I, I, uh, I, I try to pride myself on at least like being able to um, let other people give their point of view. Um, I, I don't feel like we learn anything otherwise. Um, but but there's also yeah, you got to be able to talk and be honest, you know, and and and, and you, you you can explain to me why you don't believe. You can be skeptical. At the same time, you know, you can stay true to who you are. I can share my faith with you. You know what I mean? And it's up, really up to you at the end of the day whether or not you believe me or not. But the fact that is that we're having a dialogue and there's no name calling. There's nobody calling each other stupid. Not a lot of dumbness going on right now. You know what I mean? Um, and I really I, like it, you know. I'm, I'm having a great time, actually. And I, I find a, a lot of the key is, is just attempting to clarify um, the other person's position when you – I find I find when I find something I don't agree with, um, the best thing to do is just maybe ask about it um, in a in a more direct way, or try to try to get um, a, a clarification on on what it is that you disagree with. 
um, before or getting mad about it, right? Uh, because it, it can be a little more constructive to at least let them get explain that point more fully. I find your a lot of your anger will just be taken right out of you because you'll find that you actually agree with them uh, when uh, when you, when they fully explain how how they're viewing the situation. Well, one of the early compliments I used to give atheists uh, when I first started encountering them, I'm sorry, encountering them was that, well, at least if an atheist becomes a Christian, you know, it would be really hard to get them to stop being a Christian. <laughs> that, <laughs> or, 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 or rather, atheists are not gullible. Atheists, when, 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 when you can actually have a conversation with them and, and they can explain why they're skeptical, um, you, you, you can begin as a Christian to see that a lot of the atheists out there are not gullible. They're not. Not in the sense that, that I can come to them and say, hey, you want to believe in Jesus and follow me uh, to heaven? You know what I mean? They're, they're not just going to be just be gullible and just hop on the, hop on the train and, you know, and, just, and just start following you. And it's not going to work that way with an atheist. You're going to have to be able to go to them, spend some time with them, explain why you believe, you know what I mean, and, and actually like, interact with them and conversate with them and whatnot before anything like that ever happens. You know what I mean, and that's one of the good qualities about atheists. Is is is, and I, and yes, I said this for the eight viewers that are watching this. I said that there are good qualities about uh, the atheist community that you are not gullible. Okay, but at the same time, let me say this as a moderator of this uh <laughs> of this conversation. Until you disprove answered prayers, proof that God exists, I'm still gonna keep asking you, why don't you believe that God exists. Just saying. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't know. I don't know. Um, I suppose. I guess. I guess to break it down, like with the with a question like that, I would uh, I would kind of look at it like um, when I when I um when I'm evaluating if uh I should believe in something uh that that's going to be doing something. Uh, that's that claimed to be the you know the cause of something in my reality. Um, I would um, look at it kind of like. Uh, it, sorry, my uh, my cat climbing up a wall. Um, can I uh, take <laughs> just just a few seconds here? I better I better go address. Hey, it. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. Thank I, you I, very I, much, Steven. It, it, uh, yeah. Score some points. Maybe read from the Bible a bit. I'm sure I'm sure your viewers will love that. <laughs> I'll say something to the viewers. Um, cool, again, I'm enjoying this. No problem. I'm enjoying a conversation with the anti-theists. Who would ever figured that? But uh, atheists who are watching this particular YouTube uh, uh, Google Hangout, this is how you have a conversation with a Christian. This is how you disagree with a Christian, and this is how you um, uh, get some of your ideas across with a Christian. Not calling a stupid, uneducated, gullible, dumb, and all the other things that you guys like to call us on YouTube, thinking because we're Christians that we're not going to... Um, you know, say some things back to you. Um, I do want to say this, though. Um, again, I'm a little surprised that I'm able to uh, <laughs> have this awesome conversation with this with this anti-theist. Um, but uh, now that you're back, I would like to ask you a question about... Um, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, I hear you. I'd like you to know. ask you a question real quick. Sure, yeah, no problem. Okay, I have my... Yeah, I, I, I kind of have my own definition for, like, a, a anti-theist. Anti-theist is somebody that doesn't want God to exist. Now, I'm mm -hmm. not 100% sure that necessarily fits your definition. Yeah. And no, it, it's I, as anti, yeah. anti being against a theist. So, therefore, you yeah. don't want nothing to do with the theist, right? Am I... Am I, I guess. I, I suppose you could, you could look at it like that. Um, I, guess, I guess, technically, I am against... Theism uh, in in uh, my position um, because I do believe that uh, the um, the the realization that there's probably no yeah the realization that there's probably no God is the uh, is is one of the greater uh, realizations that you can have. Uh, it's, it's but you're not 100 percent sure about that. No, I do not believe uh, that you're 100 percent sure about that. Right. Um, I I'm non omniscient, so I don't believe in certainty. I think that's a fantasy. Um, there are certain things that we can be reasonably certain about, um, and I think that's we we all kind of have this this scale of certainty. I would say um, going from well, you know, I, 99 point nine to, to zero. I don't know if I agree with that though. Hmm. Well, because, because I would you do I would agree that I, yeah, I mean I I agree that that existence is 
primary, that, that it, for something to do something, it needs to exist. Um, but other than that, die. I don't... Um, Dying is a certainty. Yeah, but only in... We um, live and we're all going to die. Infrared, only in an inferential way, right? Like, yeah, everything around me dies. Every human I've ever known or experienced um, has died uh, before me. But I don't necessarily know what's going to happen to me tomorrow, right? Or that my experience, that I've experienced so far, is accurate. Um, so it's in, in that sense, right, exactly. In that sense, I don't believe in absolute certainty because I don't know everything. Uh, and I think that admission is a very powerful one um, if, you, if you really uh, analyze it and, and kind of live your life by it, um, that, there's, that there's this... Uh, that uncertainty kind of forces you to deal with the now instead of, you know, um, dealing with always this this uh, this constant projection into the future. Um, but uncertainty in in uh, in that sense can be I like I I understand where um, theists kind of get the wrong impression about that um, because we we use a uh, verisimilitude or, or certainty uh, in science to describe that something is going to always happen uh, the way that it, it's happened uh, in the past, right? Uh, and that we, we, we use we use that we use those kind of observations to determine uh, what is what is a certainty and what isn't. But there's always uh, even even in scientific method we actually do assign like a certain level of certainty with any experiment um, because we understand that uh, the impossible does actually happen um, in a very small small percentage of the case. Uh, and we we kind of we kind of dismiss that as outlying. Uh, events, um, but I think sometimes that's uh, that is kind of where uh, the the our our actual problem uh, between our two views lies is uh, is this this idea of certainty um, that you can be certain of uh, something exterior to yourself, uh, and I don't I don't think that I have uh, that sort of certainty. I wish the Bible thumping wingnut was here, and you said that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I realize I. I because I realize the uh, I realize the problem that that ends up uh, be, be coming from that from that idea, right? Um, there is well, the Bible thumping we nut. I guess into that subject a lot with the atheist community. Um, mm -hmm. if, if 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 you haven't necessarily watched his channel uh, lately, uh, uh, check it out and you'll see what I mean. <laughs> yeah, I, I very I very rarely get to get to peruse that uh, those those videos, but I have I have seen a couple of them. So um, what is your opinion uh, about him? I'm curious because because I think he's I think he's kind of fair with the atheist community, to be honest. In in some of his um, videos, I feel that he does uh, he does kind of portray a very maybe an honest uh, is, uh, that's a reasonable way a very honest um, way of approaching uh, the issue, um, and he does uh, a fairly good job of uh, dealing with atheist arguments. But I, I feel sometimes he misinterprets uh, on purpose to uh, make his point, and I. I, th I feel that uh, like, uh, at some point that becomes dishonest once it's pointed out to you um, in that in that way. Uh, but I, I don't think he means any harm by it, um, and I, I think that he really does maybe believe that we uh, we're not certain we're here, or that we're not certain like that of. Uh, but but what we're talking about is is really um, a, a degree of certainty um, that we run through. We run through uh, probability filters in our brain uh, constantly when it comes to uh, predicting. Future events. So I mean, it's not, it's not like we're, uh, it's not like we're saying that uh, we can't know the future. Um, we're saying that certainty is something that isn't afforded to us non-omniscient beings. That like the very nature of our non-omniscience makes certainty, in any sense, uh, very flimsy to grab onto. Right? Like we're we're kind of relying on a lot of correlational evidence to, to establish any sort of certainty. Well, one of my viewers uh, wants me to ask you a question, and I'm going to ask sure. you the question. I love um, it. And the question goes like this. If you can't know anything outside of yourself, how can you know what anyone else can know? Hmm. Um, again, it would come down to uh, verisimilitude in, in, in the fact that, like, I know that I am a human being, um, that sort of, uh, I've, I've established from my sensation and my experience of being inside my body. Um, now, when I say being inside my body, I'm not referring to 
uh, a, a soul in any way that's separate from my brain, only the, you know, the subjective point of view that I've kind of created for myself. Um, now, when I'm, if, uh, so if, to be sure of something that's outside my body, um, yeah, is impossible, but I can observe that other people are human beings like me and exhibit a lot of the same traits and, uh, you know, uh, expound a lot of the same desires and uh, wishes that I seem to expel. And when I approach them with my uh, with my questions, they respond in certain ways that you know can give me insight into them. Um, and so through that, I can establish that they will have similar, uh, if not identical, uh, responses to actions that I would have if the roles were reversed. It's a, it's a you know a process of empathy that is pretty useful uh, with when dealing with uh, social primates, uh, it's a, a useful tool kind of we've developed. Yeah, that's how I would okay. explain it anyways. I don't know if that's a, an answer to the question, um, but I do accept the, the limitations of my uh, ability to know someone else's thoughts, um, and I think that's, a, that's okay. a really important thing. All right. Just do me a favor and answer that uh, short, condensed <laughs> oh, okay. way for me so, so that the people sure. watching will get a simple answer. Right. Um, while I can't know someone else's thoughts, I can know that they probably think like me, uh, that if there's a good likelihood that they are going to react as I would react. Um, it's a variation on the golden rule, um, and it's kinda, it kind of takes more consideration with the long-term consequences um, of my actions, but I, yeah, I, I think that's a pretty good summation. Okay. Um, earlier, you said that um, that 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 we can't be certain. We, we can't be certain about uh, about really anything, right? Can't really be certain about nothing, right? Um, and yeah, uh, 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 you said that um, that 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 we that we exist, and we could be certain that we exist, right? Um, uh, and then I mentioned um, that well, it's a certain it's a certainty that we're going to die, and then you said, and you said. Um, it's not necessarily a certainty that I am going to die, um, only that everybody else has died. Okay, but how yeah. certain are you about that, though? Um, <laughs> that's a good question. Probably 75%. Uh, like, you can, you can kind of... But the point uh, is... Because I is, have an experience... You, you, you have a level of certainty, though. Yeah. Um, it's kind of different when we're talking about uh, death because because death is a process, not necessarily an end point. Um, we can we can tell that um, as you get closer to being old that you uh, are getting more and more likely to die, right? And there's a certain age where likelihood of death is more likely than uh, likelihood of waking up the next day, right? Um, so um, when we're talking about uh, but the point is we get older, right? But I d okay, like, and if we because, get, just because I don't, then what is happening? I, right, just because I, um, I'm, I'm saying that I'm not certain that I'm going to die. Um, it's because I'm not certain. It's, it's, it has to do with a, with a really, a very small percentage of, of uh, possibilities that I'm not uh, experiencing reality properly. Right, that I'm not actually going to grow old. That you know, tomorrow I'm going to be the same age, which would be. Unlikely, but I suppose it could be possible. Um, but but what we're, what we're talking about here is a, is an honesty of my position, right? We can't I can't know um, for certain what what uh, what uh, what the future might hold. That would be a dishonest position. To hold, I think. <laughs> Are I you eternal? <laughs> yeah. Um, well, that would be an interesting question. Um, I. I don't, uh, I don't believe in absolutes like that, um, but it would be an interesting question to um, discuss whether or not I'm eternal uh, in, a, in a sense that's meaningful to me. Um, but, uh, but other, no, I don't, I don't believe that I, per se, am eternal. Okay, so if you're not eternal, then that means you're going to die. Well, the process of aging is occurring in my body, and I can observe that. So from I can infer from that that, yeah, I will die. And not just you. I'm not picking on you. I'm going to die, too. 
No, so right. If, but if, if, but in my defense, though, if my if my experience suddenly changed tomorrow and my body began to grow younger, would I infer that I was going to be born again? Like, it's possible that my experience could suggest that. Um, but I don't I don't necessarily think that that's a likely scenario. Um, but you do understand that Christians believe that when you place your faith in Jesus Christ, that you will be eternal one day. That yeah. you will live with God for all of eternity. No suffering, no pain, you know, uh, no longer being separated from Almighty God when you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Right. Well, I mean, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure if we can necessarily... Uh, Kind of conclude that that's uh, a likely possibility. Um, I don't know. Uh, like, I went in the we, Well, I'm 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 confused about what would end up uh, living on. Right? Um, would it be an old version of myself, a very young version of myself? Would it be an infant? Um, I I think the Bible is, is less than clear about uh, what it is that's going to live on. Um, if it's if it's only spirit. Um, it seems very confusing to me that it's going to live on uh, eternally, um, because if it's if it's interacting with with my body now, uh, wouldn't it uh, have some sort of physical component? That uh, are we are we shedding the me mechanisms for controlling a a physical body? Someone wants to, wants me to ask you a question, and I came in to pronounce the words that they want me to um oh. that they want me to ask you. So I'm hoping that well, that that, that this person will come into the Google Hangout. But 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 I get the general um, the general idea of um uh, of what they're asking me to do. Um, yeah. I I just worry about the concept of a soul existing uh, outside of of my body. Finished uh, its process. Ah. Okay. So Matthew four nineteen is here. Do you know who he is? Uh, Hello. Well, I'm aware of his uh, of some of his work. Yeah. Okay, uh, Matthew four nineteen. Um, meet um, uh, uh, Mr. Mac Dropout, MC Dropout. Well, Mick, Mick Dropout, fun. Have we been Have hey, we uh, been interacting? For the, the conversation, I'll call you Matthew. Uh, Matthew four nineteen. Uh, I've I have uh, I've been kind of I viewed uh, the Bible something wingnut for the first time a little while ago. Um, you did you did answer some of my questions uh, when we were when we were talking. There. Yeah, did we? But have we been interacting on um, sure. capricious black boxes? Um, latest upload or or am I thinking? I, I, yeah, I think you did. I think you did send me. Uh, I think I did see a private message in there. Uh, YouTube is horrible for trying to get to my inbox. I, I know, YouTube, dude. It's frustrating. Like, no, it's so it's so inconsistent. Like, like in terms of how it notifies you. Some pages you. have it and some pages don't, and I I, I, right. I, know, I never know how to I never know how to reply properly. So uh, yeah, but I did I did see that you uh, you had replied to Christian right. Black uh, video there. Yeah. Sure. No. Uh, no. Yeah. I'd be interested in in, uh, in your thoughts. Uh, I heard I heard you had a question for me. Well, <clears throat> I guess I, I'm just curious in terms of how what is truth. Hmm. Um. That's a, that's a that's a pretty large question. Uh, I've been doing a little bit of thinking about that uh, lately. Um. I think sometimes the misunderstanding might be uh, in the idea that truth is a thing that we can. Define it as a thing. Um, I believe truth is a. Uh, it's really how do I describe it? It's a property of a proposition. Um, when when we're saying something's true, we're actually talking about a claim or a proposition, um, a, a, a series of, of words that that means something and tries to paint a picture of uh, a, a possible version of reality. Uh, in, in how detailed it is, I guess, is, is up for debate um, when we just when we when we use the proposition. Um, but I think that uh, truth is just how we describe it. How we it's when we're describing how well that proposition describes reality. Um, and I think that's that's a pretty that's a pretty good description of truth. It's it's uh, it's a property of a proposition uh, describing how it how it uh, how accurately it reflects uh, the reality it's attempting to describe. 
Sorry if that's a little long-winded. Well, it, well, it's not that it's it's long-winded. It's just that it's unclear because you can say the same thing about f falsehood. So how do, how do you determine that which is true from that which is false? Um, it's a comparison between the two. Um, as re because we're trying to paint a picture of reality, we can say that uh, when a proposition accurately reflects it, it is a true proposition. Um, the idea of falsehood is only really in comparison to it. We're only saying it doesn't actu accurately reflect reality as, uh, as we're observing it. Um, so in that way, you're right. I mean, there is, there is, uh, I've definitely heard uh, it be suggested that us atheists have a very subjective idea of what truth is. Um, but it's subjective in uh, sort of a, a solipsistic sense instead of, a, instead of an objective uh, reality sort of sense. Do you see what I'm saying? Um, there's no... I, I agree, and I, I do think that's the way you guys do try to define it, but I don't think that you live your life in that reality. Well, I, I'm, I'm curious how you describe truth, because I, because I see it as a, a description of a proposition. Uh, if, if you can divorce the truth from a proposition, I would be uh, more likely to accept that my definition well, is inaccurate. But I, I, don't think, I don't think that the two can be separated. Well, I say that truth is that which comports with the mind of God. Uh... So, if I say um, I'm lying, that's a true statement. If you're saying you are a lion, if yeah, exactly. So, is that a true statement? No. Well, um, it. Uh, but it, so you're just. But how does that comport with the mind of God? Um, saying I'm not a lion. That's that's my. God's mind is that I'm not a lion. No, no. Let me explain. And because, um, what percentage of all knowledge in the whole universe do you think you have? Uh, that would be. Um, I have as much knowledge as I have gathered now. Um, as far like, as you see, when you like say the 1%, word knowledge, one per one percent would be huge, right? I think that um, even if I had 1%, the second I said it, I would have less knowledge. I think that knowledge is eternally uh, expanding uh, with every passing second. Do you well, see what I'm saying? The, the, um, reason the, second I, the second I said, yes. I have knowledge, that would be an addition to knowledge itself. And you would, it would actually be addition to your knowledge also. So you would have had more knowledge than you had uh, before, you see what I'm saying? Whether or not my statement was true, you're gaining more knowledge. Knowledge has increased. I, I can't know all of it, uh, so it's always a steadily decreasing amount that I know. Well, let me let me just give you the point that I'm I'm driving at here. That the only the only way that you can have knowledge, justified true belief, uh, in any form, is to either have all knowledge or have revelation from somebody who does. And the way I will explain this to you is to say, to, for easy math, if I have 1% of all the knowledge in all of the known universe, the 99% that I don't know could contradict the 1% that I do know. So either I have to know everything to know anything, or I have to have revelation from someone who does know everything. And that's God. And it's a God of the Bible who the Bible says that all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge lie in Christ. Hmm. Okay. So that, that's, that's how I justify my knowledge claims. I guess I'm wondering how you justify your knowledge claims when you make statements such as, um, I can't really know anything outside of myself, therefore you can't either. Um, it, it, that's a two-coke fallacy, and plus, again, you don't live your life that way. Well, obviously, for pragmatic reasons, we, we uh, operate on degrees of certainty. Um, but I, I'm, I'm a little curious. You, are you, I mean, are you certain you, of that? Uh, yeah, yeah. Yes, I am. Uh, but uh, certainty in and that how, case, And to what degree of certainty are you certain of that? Let's see. If I had to put a number on it, 65%. But, uh, and you're certain so of certainty, that? But certainty in that case would be an honorific title. Um, any, anything, and same with absolutes. Um, but I'm, I'm curious. Are you certain you, of that? 
I'm absolutely certain. Um, so you say that. Um, okay, wait. In order so, to have so all is knowledge, certain, is certain absolute, or do you have do you have degrees of it? Again, both of them are, are are honorific in in nature. I'm not I'm not suggesting that I have all knowledge. In fact, I've admitted it several times that I'm not omniscient and and uh, can be wrong uh, about numerous numerous things. But I, um, when I when I use the word certain, I'm giving you uh, uh, a, an honorific title, which will give you an indicator of the context I'm using the words in. Um, when 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 you when someone tells you I have the truth and you say no I have the real truth, you're not making the distinction that you have a more uh, a better version of a truth and that he has a truth but you have a better version of truth. No, you're suggesting that my my truth is better, uh, and by default your truth is wrong. You're you're giving it the honorific title. You're not giving it uh, the actual title, the literal title that it would imply. So uh, that's that's what I mean by absolute. Um, or a certain. Uh, we're we're talking about uh, about degrees of certainty, not necessarily uh, uh, an absolute uh, uh, an absolute sense of knowledge. Um, but I but I, I'm curious about about the way you put um, that we have to have all knowledge to know anything. Uh, that seems like a, a false premise right off the bat. Well, um, again, what you have to here's my the thing. my knowledge that I'm not omniscient uh, requires me to not know everything. So right there, I'd say that's a that's a problem with your with your assertion. So how so what is knowledge in your worldview? Uh, Defin definitionally. Well, that's a that's a weird one. Um, knowledge would be what I can demonstrate to be true. Um, and how would now you know? In, in if knowledge is that which you can demonstrate to be true, and yet you really haven't given a a cogent definition of truth and and how you discern that we're already stuck in in a circle. Well, truth, so truth let's is get clearly... back to the let's get back to the to the definition of truth. Okay. Well, I thought, I, I thought I gave a pretty cogent one. Um, truth is what I mean. I, I've heard it. I've heard it summarized as truth is correspondent to reality. Now, I I find that a little uh, simplistic for my uh, attempt at at defining truth, but. But I would say that the truth has to have some basis in reflecting reality, and truth is the property of the proposition that we're attempting to uh, use to paint a, a picture of reality. Um, so, in a, with a correspondence theory of truth. So, so you saying truth is what reflects God? I don't, I don't understand how that is because truth has to do with proposition. Because I because I told what, you. What I about a proposition? Is a if I don't of have. God. Because it's impossible to know anything, because otherwise the things that I don't know could be in direct contradiction with the things that I do know. So either I don't know anything, or I have revelation of things for certain, of truth, from someone who is indeed omniscient. And you no. have that same thing as well. That is why I say you don't live in this reality of I have degrees of certainty. There are certain things you are absolutely certain of. You are certain you are a male every time you go take a leak. <laughs> there is nothing outside it. There is nothing that could contradict that truth. Now, does that require uh, the, God? The evidence, no. the evidence could, could contradict that truth, right? Like um, that's that's the difference uh -huh. in in our position is that. If if the evidence changed, I would have to be forced to change my position, uh, and that's my that's that's the difference that I have with the truth. Yeah, the, the truth to me but right evidence, now is, evidence, is confirmed. Evidence presupposes truth. Hmm. I don't I don't see how that how that is. Um, the evidence supports or uh, well, evidence supplies us the the uh, comparison with the proposition to determine if the proposition is true. Um, but I don't see how evidence presupposes truth. Truth would be uh, a proposition still. Um, that's I still don't I still don't understand how you're 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 assuming so that truth, there's so truth is not absolute. Uh, no, I, I can't believe I can't believe that truth would be absolute in that in that sort of uh, comparison relationship. Um, so if 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 truth is not absolute, that would mean that the laws of logic are not absolute either. So the law of non-contradiction is not absolutely true. Like you and I could be simultaneously talking and not talking at the exact same time in the exact same way, if that were true, right? No, I, uh, truth, truth in, in the sense I'm using it is, uh, is describing only its use when we're describing language uh, and our use of it. Um, 
So in that way, the laws of logic don't don't necessarily apply because they can be shown in, in other ways to uh, to exist besides language. Uh, it, the propositions that exist within logic um, can be said to be true or not true uh, based on their uh, their comparison with the reality. Um, but if our comparison with the reality ever changed, the those laws of logic would be different, and that different interpretation of them would be true. Okay, so you basically have a correspondence theory of truth. You said that's a little oversimplistic, so uh, I, I, I grant you that. But So sure. essentially, truth is that which you can discern through your five senses, through your memory, and through your reasoning. That would be, that would be a, a, a good uh, summation of the mechanisms that I can use to ascertain uh, the comparison between the proposition and reality. Yeah. Okay, now... When you say that um, that truth is discerned through those mechanisms, would you agree that there are those who do not have properly function properly functioning mechanisms um, to discern truth, given the correspondence theory of truth, that they don't have valid reasoning, they don't have valid senses? For instance, uh, uh, um, somebody who is going through, um, you know, like a crackhead going through DTs or a, a psychopath in an insane asylum packed into a padded room, that right. there are those who um, don't have valid reasoning, right? Could be said to, yeah, I mean, have a, a problem with their senses or their reasoning. Um, I, I, can, I can see, um, I've, I've heard this argument before. Uh, it is possible that people can have one or more of their senses, uh, reasoning, um, faculties, or, okay. or anything that could be so, wrong with their brain. Here's, here's the thing. So if that is the case and you have a correspondence theory of truth and y you, you agree that there are people who don't have valid reasoning, how do you know you're not one of those people? Mm. Uh, I think it's uh, because of the one thing you left off your list as, uh, that I would, I would include as a tool to determine what the truth is, and that is um, getting other people's opinion around you. Um, so well, now, if, you're, if your reasoning so, is invalid, those people may not actually even exist. They could just be a, a psychopathic um, delusion in your mind. Like the movie, that movie, A Beautiful Mind, that had the, the CIA agent following him around and clipping newspaper clippings and things like that. How, you know, how do you know you're not one of those people? Hmm. Well, I suppose it is, uh, it is kind of a slippery slope to claim that I don't have certainty that I'm not one of those people, um, but I will say that um, there will be um, an, obvious, an obvious way of, of ascertaining if my senses and reasoning are working properly, and that is through standardized testing, right? Um, we can use different ways of standardized testing to But uh, here's where that fails, because uh, you still have to use your senses and your reasoning and your memory to determine if that standardized testing is even valid. And we don't even know if your senses and reasoning are valid in the first place to know that that's not a delusion that's happening in your mind in the first place. Right. And this is, um, and this is, this guess, is the important point here that I want to make, is that and I said this in the beginning of the conversation, that you do not live in this way. You do not live in a world of I don't know. You know, there's a lot of people who say, well, the only thing that I know is that I don't know anything. Well, clearly nobody lives that way because that's a self-refuting statement. Um, you, you do know things. I'm not saying that you don't know anything or I have some special knowledge that you don't. I'm telling you God makes me know things the same way he makes you know things. That's why the Bible says that he has made himself known to everyone and we suppress the truth in our unrighteousness. And that's why, that is what makes hell reasonable. And that's why you need to repent. And because Jesus Christ died to save you from your sin and to save you from your, from this mechanism that you have in your mind that's basically chasing any bag of cats to deny God, the God that you know exists. Okay, well, I would agree that we have uh, similar mechanisms for experiencing our reality and uh, navigating in this world. Um, you're right, we're, we're, we're all just using our experiences, um, and I, I don't see how the fact that uh, this world is, is uh, very similar and, and seems to follow uh, you know, a very uh, natural order 
is any sort of uh, is any sort of way of, of uh, asserting that you can you can be certain about anything, right? Um, I feel like I feel like there's no there's no path to uh, the certainty that you're you seem to be claiming about about the the notions that you have. So I think I, I think that's my biggest problem. Do you know that? Uh, yeah, I think I do. Um, because I know my own thoughts fairly certainly. Um, but, but, but you just said that all of your reasoning could be invalid. All of your all of your senses and reasoning could be invalid. So no, how, not, do you, how do you know that? See, not do you all. Have of a do you have a correspondence theory theory of truth, and you don't even know that your senses and reasoning are valid. That means you could be wrong about everything you claim to know. Uh, but I but I explained I could be wrong about my existence or the fact that I don't know everything. Um, those are two things that I can know. With a reasonable amount of certainty, um, uh, just just the uh, just the fact that they're impossible to be uh, otherwise. Um, so you're wrong that I that I could be wrong about everything. That I claim to know. Well, um, I I am, and I don't I, I don't feel like I don't feel like absolute certainty is necessary for me to uh, exist in this world, right? Like this world is um, very similar. We we know that it does uh, operate. Uh, according to a certain amount of uh, laws and natural, uh, and just because of the way we've uh, we've observed it, so I don't I don't feel like I'm stepping out on a leash by by uh, admitting that we're not a hundred percent certain uh, that every time uh, we drop a pen, it's going to fall to the to the ground. But we we know to a reasonable degree of certainty that if everything remains the same, if we remain in this environment and on this earth, and everything remains the same, we can be certain that this will fall. So I, I well, that's it, begging the question, but nonetheless, I agree with you. You can't be wrong about everything that you claim to know. Mm -hmm. And given my 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 definition of truth and my reasoning for it, that is the conclusion that how you know that God exists the same way that I do. That God has made it clear to you because you have certainty, because you have knowledge, because you. Um, because of the laws of logic, because of absolute morality, and because of the, um, the uniformity of nature, all of these things are the clear revelation of God's existence. And that's why God sends people to hell for denying him. If he, um, if he sent you to hell and you had genuine ignorance of him, he would be unjust, but you don't. You don't have ignorance of him. As the Bible says, and again, as a presuppositionalist, you know I stand on the authority of Scripture, and, and anything that anybody says which contradicts that, I, I reject. So when the Scripture says that you suppress the truth in your unrighteousness, that's not me calling you a liar. That's simply me telling you what the Scripture says. No, I understand that. I'm, uh, so, I'm not, so I'm, I'm, I'm not, not uh... insulting. A lot of people get really insulted by the presuppositional um, argument when you say, well, you know, you're telling me what I know, No, uh, there's no way you could know, you know, I, I'm simply telling you what the scripture says, you know, as right. a, as a Christian and as a, as an evangelist and as a presuppositionalist, you know, the analogy that I use is like, you know, a king who has a kingdom, and there are rebels who have fought against the kingdom, and, and the king doesn't send his herald to the rebels and say, go prove to those rebels I exist. He says, no, go and tell those rebels that they need to repent, that they need, that today is a day of amnesty, and that if they turn from their rebellion today, they can be reconciled to me. That's that's my position, that I, as a herald of the King of Kings, Jesus Christ, I call you as a rebel sinner today to repent and have the amnesty that he has given through the blood of his Son, Jesus Christ. And I submit to you that if you do not do this, because you know God exists and you deny him in your unrighteousness, he will make you pay with an eternity in hell. And I don't tell you that as like a, a threat. That's not like fear-mongering or anything. Again, I'm telling you what Scripture says. So, yeah. Yeah. No, I. Uh, no, Matthew. I don't. I don't. I don't. Uh, I don't feel like you're you're doing that out of uh, out of any sort of spite or anything. Uh, okay. Uh, cool. I understand. I understand the spirit in which you're in which you're. Yeah. Uh, uh, saying that to me. Um, you'd be surprised how much. Uh, I, I mean, I, I did mention that I was kind of brought up uh, Pentecostal. You'd be surprised how much presupposition is actually kind of worked into a lot of the a lot of the dogma there. Um. So I have, I have, in fact, heard, uh, heard that heard that message before. That uh, 
that we do we're we're suppressing the truth in in our righteousness. Um, yeah. So um, I don't know. I just I feel like uh, maybe I should I should try to try to summarize maybe my point. Um, maybe just just kind of a, a way that I found uh, to, to kind of refute maybe the the presuppositional argument. Um, or just maybe maybe refute your claim of of, abs uh, of basing your certainty. Uh, can I, 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 I kind of I, I can tell you how to defeat the presuppositional argument. Two words. Yeah. De deny truth. Deny. That's all you have to do. <laughs> you deny truth and you've defeated presuppositionalism. Hey, red line, I, did you hear I don't that? Know, that's... <laughs> <laughs> anyway, cool. Well, so so here's here's what here's here's my problem with the presuppositional argument, and I'll I'll just, I'll just get, lay it out here. Uh, okay. Because uh, I because I know you guys have might have a problem. You've probably heard of the Aces rebuttal, where um, if you are you know an auto an automatic computer entity or something to that to that effect, um, it, it's basically a, a play on the Matrix uh, is what they're is what they're doing, right? Um, that your certainty in your senses is not absolute, but you know that you're receiving information. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, the presuppositional argument seems to say that um, unless you have all knowledge or know someone who does, you can't know anything. And th the way I kind of uh, put this into uh, the analogy is um, atheists are saying, yeah, we might be in the matrix. Um, we may be being fooled about all of our senses, but at least we know that we're receiving something. Uh, and that's, that's, that's pretty good. Um, that's what we can say with certainty. Um, and what uh, theists apparently are saying is that um, we are in the matrix, uh, and I can be I can know this for certain because I know the architect. Um, and I think that I think that kind of uh, I think that kind of lays out my problem with the with the argument um, because to know something like the architect or to to have any sort of knowledge of an architect. Uh, is knowledge in itself, um, and you're you're kind of already presupposing that you can't know anything by saying you may be in the matrix. Do you see what I'm saying? Um, you're you're kind of presupposing that the knowledge you're you're receiving is ex external, and by doing that, you're you're kind of making it impossible for you to have certainty um, because the information is no longer being received on uh, a first person uh, basis to your to you the you as a person. Do you see what I'm saying? Um, not exactly, actually. Because because your claim to certainty requires that you know the architect. Uh, have you seen the Matrix series? Um, yes. That mm -hmm. your your claim to certainty requires you to know the architect of the Matrix, but that doesn't help you because you're still trapped in the Matrix. Like you're you're still you're affirming that we are in the Matrix instead of just accepting the possibility that we're in the Matrix. Well, we may or may not be able to. Trust the way yourself. that the reason that falls apart, the reason that falls apart is because for that to be for that to be analogous, everyone in the matrix would have to have had the blue pill. Or was it the blue pillar that gave him reality, or the I, 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 I can't remember. The red pill. I believe the red okay. pill. Yeah, blue pill was reality. You, and the red pill, you, you know the point that, that they would have had that, to choose the reality. Yeah, for that to be analogous, okay. because I'm telling you, you have this knowledge also. Mm, I see. I, okay, I can see. I can see. That, that, I don't, that's I don't what agree. I'm that, yeah, and I think that's that's probably where we where we differentiate is that I don't feel like I have that knowledge. You you feel like I do. Okay. All right. Yeah. yeah mm -hmm. That's that's a that's a fair point. That's a fair point. Yeah, I, see, so, I see where my analogy falls short. That's that's the uh, yeah. Awesome. And you know the Aces rebuttal is you know I, I think that's been pretty well refuted. At least well if you followed me or the Bible thumping wingnuts channel or if you saw Cy Tem Bruggen Kate. Um, talk with uh, um, Live Life 8072, he pretty well, you know, demolished that argument um, basically in, in, in the same way, but much more eloquently, <laughs> I guess, than, than I did. But, um, but yeah, man, I guess, you know, my whole, my whole point in, in talking to atheists and, and non-Christians non in general is, you know, to, to let you know that there is you know whether you call it the architect it, it's god and it's the god of the bible and you know i don't i don't tell you about um you know i tell you about him because he is truly the greatest thing in the world and um he's worthy of all of your sacrifice and all of your 
praise and all of your worship and everything. And I know you don't agree with that now. And I, you know, while I'm a presuppositionalist, I'm also a Calvinist. So I believe that, you know, all of my argumentation really can't convince you that it truly takes a work of the Holy Spirit. But he, the Holy Spirit, works through the preaching of the gospel. So that's why I'm sharing it with you. And you know, I hope that uh, you give it some careful consideration because you seem like a you seem like a really decent guy, and uh, you know, I, I would I, like to embrace you as a brother in Christ someday, honestly. Uh, well, I, I, I appreciate that, Matt. I uh, you know, I uh, I can appreciate the love that you're sending, anyways. If, yeah, man. Not, uh, if if we don't agree on everything, I uh, you know, I hope you don't take it. Yeah. Uh, take hey, it can, as, uh, can you link your channel in chat so I can check that out? I, I gotta get going because I gotta put my little girl to bed. It's about ten fifteen my time here, so if you can put your channel up in chat, I would like to check you out and maybe send you a PM or something. Sure, Would no you? problem. I don't, I don't have any videos up as yet, but I, I hope oh, you okay. hang up. So uh, yeah, definitely. I, I, I appreciate a PM from you. I'll, uh, yeah. I'll definitely, I'll definitely keep interacting and try to, try to follow you. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's a good Thanks. conversation. Absolutely. Uh, I, I try to be nothing if not considerate in all the all the yeah. senses of the word. Yeah, and I, I could detect that when I kind of stumbled on this on Gary's channel here. So, mm -hmm. or G Man, G Man's channel. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't worry about it. They all know my first name by now. Yeah, anyway. I know. They do. I know. They do. <laughs> so, but by the way, thank you, Matthew four nineteen, for showing up and uh, yeah, here a little bit. <laughs> Thanks for the, the invitation. So, um, is your is your username the same as your Yes, um, ab absolutely. Yes, yeah, same, okay. uh, same, the same name there. So. J McDropout. J okay. John F. John F. McDropout is, uh, is uh, how it usually shows up. So sounds good. Mm. Cool. Yeah, it was All good right, talking to you. Absolutely. Have a good night, guys. Yeah. Good night. Night, young lady. <laughs> well, that was an interesting conversation that you and uh had. Um, but I'm gonna have to uh, end this Google Hangout soon. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Stephen. I really appreciate the opportunity to, to talk, and uh, it was uh, it's really great to talk to you on Matthew 419. Also, I know he's he's got he's got some uh, some very very uh, he's got a lot of followers and some some good some really uh, interesting views. Anyways, so I'll, uh, it, was a, it was a pleasure to talk to him. Yeah. Anytime you want to do this again, just uh, you know uh, if you want my Skype information is x x o o five four g man. Uh, I'll put it in the in, in the chat section. Over there. And anytime that you want to do this again, you know, uh, there was another atheist that wanted to get part of, that that wanted to be part of this conversation. His name is Mark Anthony, but I told him not today because I'm not because he's very aggressive, and sure. um, he said some things about you that's not very nice. So <laughs> um, I didn't want him in here killing the flow that we had here. So sure, uh, well, I, I can appreciate that. I I, I'm, I welcome a lot of criticism. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, of course. Uh, it's your show, so it's up to you how much, uh, how aggressive you want uh, your guests to be. Well, Mark Anthony's a, a, a anti-theist like you too, and uh, I'm pretty sure he has a different definition for it. So I didn't want to really bring him in here so that he can, uh, you know, pretty much bring his disrespectful mouth in here as he usually does, you know. But um, I just like the flow that we had. You know what I mean? He 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 thinks that. At least I'm thinking he, he he thinks I'm looking at you as like an easy target or something like that. But no, I just wanted to have a conversation. You know what I mean? Um, you know about the things that we spoke about today, and I'm glad Matthew 419 came in. You know, and it came at you the way he did because um, you know, uh, a lot of different Christians. We 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 all have our different ways we go about like you know uh, dealing with the atheist community and you know just having conversations with you guys and you know and just having a talk. You know, but we got all the way up to nine views. Now we got six, but at one point, we was all the way up at nine. <laughs> yeah, no problem, no problem. We might have bored him a little bit with that. Uh, some of that, some of that precept talk can be a real. Uh, it, there's a lot of definitions and cir circularities that have got to be addressed. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, a little okay. bit of a snore. Cool, but, but thanks a lot. I really appreciate, it, man. It was uh, it was great talking to you. Ah, uh, you too, man. And anytime you want to do this again, you just let me know. Absolutely, same here. I'll add you to my Skype if you ever want to talk to Skype. I uh, I do. I'm, I don't know what what it's set up. I'll I'll definitely try to add you on Skype right now, though. All right. I guess we'll talk again later. Thanks a lot. All right. See you later. Yeah, mm -hmm. have a good night. And then, good night. And for those of you who are watching, until next time, you know the deal. Re it, and this has been another edition of uh, Preaching to the Choir Ministries. Read your Bible and do what it says. <laughs>